Hello and welcome to this podcast about the business of video games with me, Daniel Goldberg, and you, Shams Giorgiani. Hello, Shams. How are you doing? I'm doing quite well. Thank you. Good. What have you been up to for the past few days? Uh, we've been doing the same thing we always do. We read up on a bunch of game pitches and say no to most of them. Okay. Any, <laughs> any good ones you've said yes to? Uh, no, we have said no to almost every single one. Okay. Well, that's a good week then, right? Yeah, I think uh, on average we say no to uh, like 99% of everything we see. Wow. So it's tough. it's tough to get your game through through Shams, through the gatekeeper Shams. Yes, but Paradox. we're a niche weird publisher that... And we do need we weird niche stuff, so we need to say no to most things. Yeah, that's what we do. That's what you do. That's your job. Yeah, saying no to things. Yep. All right, let's. Sorry, sorry about getting sidetracked in the first <laughs> thirty-five seconds. Let's start by introducing ourselves. Yeah, we both work at uh, Paradox Interactive. That's right. I do communications. You do acquisitions. And, Shams and business development. And business development. That's right. Whatever that means. Now. And Paradox, as you may or may not know, uh, is the publisher of fine games such as the Europa Universalis, Hearts of Iron, Stellaris, Crusader Kings series, City Skylines, Magica, cool upcoming stuff like BattleTech and Surviving Mars. Um, what else? What am I missing? Uh, upcoming stuff. We haven't announced most of our upcoming mm. stuff, but we have a couple of classics in our portfolio. My all-time favorite is uh, Teleglitch. Teleglitch, your favorite... Is that your favorite Paradox game? It's one of the most favorite games I, I've signed, and I think it's a really enjoyable game experience. Tell, tell the listener, what is, for those who are listening or don't know, what is Teleglitch? Uh, Teleglitch is a, is a top-down roguelike shooter that's, you know, can be described as hardcore Doom, but top-down. Yeah, it's made by three Estonian talented devs, and we put Teleglitch out in when was that? What year was 14, that? Fourteen, maybe twenty fourteen. Fourteen, yeah. And you, you were part of that of of the production of that game? Uh, no, I, I was. Uh, I found the game, and I was like, "This is genius." This was right after the time of uh, when FTL came out, Faster yeah. Than Light, and they did really well. So we were like, "Hey, we're into kind of indie games. Let's do this uh, uh, roguelike kind of game." Um, and we helped them get on Steam. Because back then, getting on Steam was really difficult, mm. as opposed to today. So we approached them and said, hey, let us publish your game. Can we offer like a discount code to listeners who are... <laughs> I don't know, we should Maybe probably have checked should, this with should, sales. Yeah. For next, no, but we can absolutely episode, do it. We're, we promise we'll have a discount code for yeah. Teleglitch in the podcast. We've given away a fair amount of copies on Teleglitch. I'm sure we can do that again. Yeah. So you've mentioned your favorite Paradox game. I should probably mention yeah, mine then. Please do. So my favorite Paradox game is a game called The Showdown Effect. That was put out a couple of years ago, I think. Yep. And I think I, I sometimes get the feeling that I was the only person in the world, not, not the only person in the world who liked this game, but uh, surely the only person who played it because it, it, <laughs> you know, it wasn't really that successful, was it? No, it was, it was the second game that Arrowhead made. Uh, it was also the second game with us. We had very high hopes and we were basically banking on the success of Magicka carrying over to uh, the showdown effect. Arrowhead are the developers of the Magicka series, we should exactly, say. Exactly, exactly. And it did not quite pan out. It was very multiplayer focused, and it, it was a it was a terrible project, mainly because I was the producer. I think you were the producer on that game. Yes, this wow. was, this was uh, in the early days of uh, Paradox when many people were wearing many different hats. At the same Everyone time. was doing everything. Yes, poorly. It was an it was an amazing game, though. I was a journalist at the time, and I reviewed Showdown Effect for one of the big papers here yeah. in Scandinavia, and I gave it like this glowing, fantastic review. Yeah. You know, <laughs> saying things like, "This is you know, Paradox have really figured." something out here this is them you know learning from the success of magic and this game will, will yeah. go on to become a huge a huge thing right and then I, I remember playing it on steam and i could literally see like the player numbers just going down 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 and eventually it was basically just me and my friends playing the game no it was utterly depressing and i uh it was a it was a terrible project from yeah. several standpoints it's a great game it's a Very terrible project game. Yeah. Let's not talk about it. All right, enough about that. Just a couple of words on what this is then, yeah. I suppose. Uh, this podcast is something we've been talking about for quite a long time, actually. We have. And the idea here is that you and me are going to sit down for half an hour, maybe 60 minutes every second week, and we're going to talk about the business of games. We might have guests now and then. Uh, we might sometimes just do it, the two of us, and we'll be talking essentially about what we do for a living, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, video game publishing, how it works, how it doesn't work, acquisitions, marketing, PR... Pricing, all of the all of the fun stuff, right? No, I think that you know, we, both of us maybe approached the, the the games industry from the consumer side, being consumer first. Yeah, and then you know, we started understanding more and more. And once you get on the inside, there are a lot of like aha uh -huh moments all the time. We're like, oh well, this context was totally missing from this Reddit thread or yeah. this rant on Twitter. 
And I think that our approach has been that let's shed a bit of light on the entire thing. And it's, it's a very interesting part of the industry, not only because we find it interesting, because a lot more people, consumers and players are interested in the story and case behind it than rather just what does the pack shot look like and, and how many headshots can I can I make per second, right? Yeah, I agree. I think it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating industry. And, you know, hopefully we'll have some, you know, maybe we've learned something throughout the years. So maybe, you know, we might have at least a couple of wisdoms to share. Uh, we'll probably say lots of stupid stuff as well. But, Absolutely. You know, we'll see as we go, I suppose. So, yeah, if you're curious to learn more about how the uh, games industry works from the inside, this is hopefully the podcast for uh, you uh, as for what we will be talking about, that sort of remains to be seen. And if you're listening, this is obviously the first episode. Uh, please let us know. What would you like to hear us talk about in uh, upcoming episodes? Yeah, I think a lot of the topics we'll be talking about will be derived from what's happening in the industry. Yeah. And generally what uh, questions are being raised by people who are listening. Uh, I don't think we're necessarily planning on it being a paradox-centric podcast in Not any sense. But that's where we are and that's the kind of lens that we'll be looking at things. So, um, you know, we can offer our perspective on, say, VR, even though we don't do VR and we can talk about That would about be a good episode, actually. That would, yeah, maybe. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. I mean, everything will naturally be filtered through a paradox perspective because that's who we are. Exactly. But hopefully this could be, uh, you know stuff that is interesting and can be applied to the industry as a whole yeah, yeah. at least at least sometimes um all right well that's it so let's get started then yeah sure so did you get a super nintendo mini yet uh, is that what they're called no i went to the store to buy something else and they had like a giant stack of them so i was like hey i'll pick one of these bastards up yeah and i was like how much is it and he said well 1600 crowns that's yeah. That's hundred and hundred and eighty. No, it's two hundred dollars. Two hundred dollars. Yeah, it's two hundred dollars. That's almost three times the price in the US, I think. And I was like, yeah, that that'll be a great gift for my daughter when she turns four in like four months. So I was like, sure, I'll pick one up. And they're like, two hundred dollars, not for you, honey. So it's didn't pick one up. No way. Too they, expensive. What, they wouldn't sell you one. Or no, I, I said no thanks because oh, it was you too, said no. All yes. oh, right, because it's, it's too expensive. Right? Too expensive. Yeah. I, I didn't pick one up either. I, I, I really wanted to, but I, I actually, I've spent a lot of time and too much money on this really cool emulator setup that I've been working on for years. I mean, obviously I own legal copies of all games that I'm emulating. <laughs> yeah, right? sure. In Sweden, at least, if you own a, uh, a copy of a game, you can do whatever you want yeah. with it. So I even have these uh, Neo, Neo Geo oh, wow. arcade sticks that I've got set up to my television. Mm. And, and I, I sort of feel like buying this retro system that makes it all work out of the box makes... It just kind of reveals how meaningless all of my <laughs> artwork was in this. So I don't think I'll buy I really like it, though. I really love it. And it's been massively successful. Um, I'm a bit surprised that they actually had them in, in store where you, where you meant to buy them because they, they're pretty much sold out yeah. everywhere. Um, I know that Nintendo haven't provided any, any sales or, or production figures, but that's the general impression I get. You can't really get these. No. Uh, and it, much, as, uh, much as with the NES Mini that came out uh, yeah. last year. Exactly. And after I made my decision not to buy, he said, I'm not going to sell it to you anyway because they're, we have back-ordered these. Oh, they're all booked already. Uh, right. Yeah. So yeah. I was like, well, that was easy then. Yeah. <laughs> so, but what's your... I mean, you as a, as a business development person, as someone who... I would assume you've had similar discussions about similar stuff many times in the past. What's your take on this, Shams? Why is this... Why is it selling? Why is it selling? I don't know, man. It's. I think it's. There's several things happening at the same time. First of all, it's like immense brand value. Nintendo yeah. is well known in that sense. But secondly, I think it's nostalgia. It's that's the main thing driving it. I don't think necessarily it's the. I mean, the price point is crazy. I don't see it as being a kind of a luxury good kind of thing, or it's not a novelty either, like a Wii where you could bring out your home, uh, your friends to your home, and you could show out this technology. So it's not an early adopter kind of situation either. Um, I think what it is, it's being driven by hype. And I think ultimately they're selling a pretty strong fantasy. Yeah. And th it's the same reason we saw maybe the Ouya initially and the oh, original uh, yeah. Oculus uh, dev kit yeah. do really well on Kickstarter because they were capitalizing on a, on the, the fantasy that I'll be sitting here holding a NES controller in my hand and it'll feel just like the good old days. Yeah. Or it was something different or new, but... I think that in six months' time, these things will be gathering as much dust as the Ouya and the DK1 yeah, Oculus. Uh, it's nostalgia, obviously. I think a really relevant question here is, would this have sold as well if we were still buying games largely in-store? 
as you know as physical products as opposed to over digital i think I, so you think so i'm yeah. not so sure why so i think there's this sort of tangible aspect to buying games that is slowly being lost you know yeah. you don't necessarily go to the shop anymore to buy stuff you you get it off steam or you get it off psn or wherever and you don't actually get that you know, you, you don't get that same sensation, that sort of ritual, if you will, of yeah. going somewhere, purchasing something, going home and putting it on your shelf. So I think that sense of buying a physical mm. item is really important. Do you think that, who's the main audience, like 30-year-olds? Yeah, it's not, so, absolutely. So I mean, do you think that the 30-year-olds have a strong need for a, a physical store ritual experience? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> what I'm saying... Do you not believe in Amazon now? Well, is that what, what you're I'm saying? What I'm saying is that it's not about the games. It's not the software. It's about the sort of physical package of it. It's, yeah. the, it's holding that controller. It's getting a box that says Nintendo on it. Uh, the sort of games, that's just a bonus, right? Yeah. What, you're, what you're paying for is the, the physical... It's kind of like vinyl, right? You know, yeah. people buying vinyl records. Vinyl is having a revival right yeah. now. Yeah, why do people buy vinyl when everything's on Spotify? Because they're I hipsters. Mean, yeah, nostalgia, obviously, but it's the sense of exclusiveness, the sort of scarcity that comes with something being a physical product yeah. and sort of getting a physical product and carrying it to your home. And what's the connection to our business then? One more point, right? Yeah. Just one more thing. You mentioned the price point. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's insanely expensive over here, yeah. but it's, I mean, 80 US dollars is also, that's quite a high price for a, a bunch of old games, right? Yeah. Do you think it would have sold as well if it was cheaper? Uh, absolutely. I would have bought it without a doubt if it cost 40. I would have gotten several ones and had them as gifts to give to my nerdy friends. I would have thought it wouldn't have sold as well if it was cheaper. How is that possible? Because the high price point makes it exclusive and sort of and the scarcity as well. It makes it sort of desirable, right? Do, do you think the scarcity is deliberate? To an extent, yes, absolutely. I think, didn't Nintendo go out and say that they are not trying to make it scarce? Just, that's just how many they created of the NES Mini? Yeah, but that's just because the NES Mini sold out, I mean, that sold out in days. They sort of severely underestimated the demand for this. You know, there's been more of these produced yeah. than, than of the NES Mini. But of course, I mean, they could have made a lot more. And here's the thing, like, I don't think Nintendo seriously is concerned that people will be sitting around playing the SNES Mini instead of buying the Switch. No, I don't right, think that's no. a real... Because the SNES Mini, you can't download any more games. No, it's, I don't think people will play it that much. To be no, honest. Like what you no, said, it's, it's about buying it. It's not about... So I don't quite understand. This is just, as from a business standpoint, this is just upselling on your fan enthusiasm. If you have a product that has a good value proposition, and obviously it does have a good value proposition, your customers are not strapped for cash necessarily. Mm. So this is just a way for them to charge 80 extra bucks that they wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Yeah. And I have no idea what the PNL looks like. And PNL for those that are listening, that means the the profit and loss uh, analysis. That's basically a case you set up to figure out. How much out money if, are we going to make on this? How much money are you going to make? Yeah. I don't know what the costs are, distribution everything, but I have a very hard time not seeing them making a giant profit out of this mm. considering the hardware that runs, you know, underneath. Uh, so I, I don't quite get it. If Nintendo's PR brand machinations are very Machiavellian, maybe this is driving up the the mythos of Nintendo somehow. But I don't quite see it. So you're basically saying this is this is going to be a drop in the ocean compared to you know oh, Switch no. and, and 3D. 3DS. Oh, it's going to be nothing. So why are they doing this then? I mean, are they being nostalgic also? No, I, mean, I think it, it's it's establishing. They're broadening their. Uh, brand base. Uh, we 30 year olds are buying it. Yeah. My daughter is three and a half. She knows who Mario is. Right. Right. And they're setting stuff up for the further generations and, and expanding that. Making okay. sure that nostalgia is there even with kids today, right? Exactly. I yeah. think this is instead of, you know, and, and I'm really going off base here. The Switch platform compared to the other consoles isn't really going for the hardcore, super mature hardcore gamers, right? You're not seeing Gears type, Gears of War type games on that platform. Um, and this is a way for them to re- not have to compromise with their portfolio, but at the same time still broaden their awareness for their type of products. All right, that makes sense. Can we relate this to what we do uh, somehow? I mean, collector's editions. Do we? What's our strategy when it comes so to, we've to really done, expensive collector's editions? Uh, we've we tried doing different types of collector's editions, and we've done. We, I think we do fairly well on the digital side uh, when it comes to collector's editions, and they are the some of the ones that sell uh, better, I believe, because ultimately it's about again coming back to this. Once the player or customer has made the decision to purchase the product then it's the, just a question of which is the best deal I can get, right? And in the case of many of our games, is that people know that they've been probably playing them for hundreds of hours. So they already figured out it's going to be worth my money. How can I get the maximum amount of value, right? 
So and that's where kind of collectors and digital editions comes in. Uh, we were kind of inspired by a collector's ed- edition that Saints Row did. Yeah. Uh, where they it cost like they had one collector's edition that cost one million dollars, <laughs> <laughs> and it included like. <laughs> a ton of stuff, including uh, uh, a trip to space. Oh, right, wow. because <laughs> they just went out and just jammed a bunch of stuff in there. I don't think they sold it. It was great PR. Yeah. So we were looking into doing something similar, and we were looking to buy a title, like actually a lordship of some sort. Uh, so you would get a lordship, like you would get uh, a title. Yes, if you, you would. This. You oh, would get. You become the Crusader du- Kings, or yeah, for Crusader Kings, like the Duke of some backwards amazing place. Uh, and they are not terribly expensive, actually. But there were a lot of other, you know, legal implications of how do we transfer a <laughs> a title to somebody else. And uh, it quickly, the enthusiasm for the idea died down when we realized it was entailed a lot of actual work. This never happened then? No. Might happen in the future. We'll see if we can pick this up. Uh, again, we revived the idea for Hearts of Iron 4, th- mm. thinking that... You buy it, you get a T thirty four tank because yeah. you can buy a lot of tanks, and they're not terribly expensive. But shipping costs are insane. <laughs> <laughs> so again, the practicalities of a boring ordinary lives got in the way of you know crazy ideas. Yeah, that's a good idea though. Yeah, can so, you own a tank as a private individual? Uh, I think is you need a, b- a bunch of different. It, it, you know, again, we come into the territory. Can it operate, or is it just a prop that sure. you're placing somewhere? But depending on your country and regulations, you you, you can get uh, a permit to do it. Uh, but coming back to the realm of reality, the challenge for us, at least, or for anyone doing niche or smaller games, is that physical goods only make sense if you can have massive volume. Yeah. Because there are so many different parts in the value chain, so everyone wants a slice of the cake. So ultimately, it doesn't end up being that big a business, unless your base is really big. If you're talking about Call of Duties, Destinies, Battlefields, Star Wars, of course— but if, uh, you know, we do great numbers in our games, but comparatively, they're very niche in that sense. So maybe we should start giving tanks to everyone who buys Hearts of Iron then. Is that what you're saying? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe that might be a good approach. So we'll see what happens. Anything's but, possible. But it also depends on what people are asking for. Like, uh, we, most of our ideas, uh, and I'm assuming a lot of other developers' ideas, come from what people are asking for. And people are, you know, they need to ask us a bit more about what they would like to see in collector's editions. Yeah. What I see other developers doing is, and something that we haven't started doing, but I'm shamelessly pushing for this. If if you go to Steam and check out a game called Prison Architect, that's really, really good. And there's another game called RimWorld. That's also really good. Yeah, we well, published the mobile edition of Prison Architect. We exactly. should mention that also. Um, we did, and it's free. You should pick it up. If you check out those Steam store pages of those games that are very much, you know, hardcore kind of paradox type of games... Um, you can actually, besides the base edition, you can buy an edition that allows you put, to put your name in the game. Mm. And then you have like a, a like a create a backstory for a character for $100 more. And then I think RimWorld has the Pirate King edition where you write an entire big campaign. And that costs like 370 bucks. So is that a collector's edition? It's a limited kind of thing. It's very special. So... Maybe stepping away from the physical goods and so stepping over to the digital goods, that's something that could be monetized. Makes more sense from our perspective. Yeah. So leaving the Super Nintendo aside for now, um, for this episode, we thought we were essentially going to talk a little bit about your job, right, Champs? That's my favorite subject. Yeah, it's, <laughs> everyone loves talking about their jobs. <laughs> no, no, no. Everyone loves talking about my job. Everyone loves talking about Champs' job, yeah. exactly. So your title is VP of Acquisitions. Yes, it used to be uh, head of the Unicorn Division. Really? Yes. That's a nice title. Because Why did that change? Because is this paradox becoming corporate? <laughs> it is because we become becoming corporate. Our beloved CFO, who was strongly against it, as a part of becoming slightly more uh, corporate. I have still have those business cards, but my title is formally VP of uh, Business Development today. Actually. Yeah, and then sort of within brackets, head of Unicorn Division. Head of Unicorn yeah. Division, yeah. So what is that, VP of Acquisitions, not head of Unicorn uh, yeah. Division, what does that mean? Just briefly, what, what is it that you do? So exactly? essentially, my job consists of two... Uh, Parts one is just finding new ways to make money off of our games by doing licenses and other things. Um, and the main job is to manage our portfolio. Mm. What essentially means finding and signing the best games possible for us to do. So I kind of joke around and say I've been with Paradox for the past eight years now. I joke around and say I'm partially responsible for some of our successes and I'm completely at fault for all of our failures. <laughs> 
Not a bad thing to have on your resume. No, it's like highs and lows. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I prefer being really high or really low then. So essentially, uh, you're the guy who, at the end of the day, decides... It's not just you, obviously, but you decide what we're going to publish. <laughs> I, I wish it was that. It was yeah. just me, but it's not. And that's. I think it's a good thing because... Back in the days of Showdown Effect, it was more or less myself and maybe and me and Fred kind of. Fred is our CEO, yeah, uh, and we were uh, we didn't have kind of a formalized process for approving stuff, so we kind of just went ahead. But ultimately, my team and myself lead the process in which all the games at Paradox are approved and started up, including you know the hypothetical CK threes, fours, fives, hmm. sixes will at some point end up on our desks. And we'll help uh, get it off the ground, but that also includes all the external projects that we've been doing sure. and looking at over the years. But so, if you're if you're a developer and you're looking to get your game uh, published by Paradox, yep. at some point you will go through either you or one or someone on your team. Yes, all absolutely. Right. So that's interesting. Let's talk about that. Let's say you're a developer then, and you, well, not you because you're going to be talking to yourself then. But let's say I'm a developer yeah. and I'm working on this fantastic game that yeah. I think Paradox would be a good publisher for. Yeah. Uh, this process starts with a pitch, right? Yeah. And most of the time, you would then be pitching to you or someone on your team. Yeah. So let's let's dive into this uh, sure. a little bit. How many pitches do you get uh, per month? We get about a thousand a year, so that's eighty a month. Uh, that's twenty a week. Uh, that's five a day. Uh, wow. That's one every two hours. <laughs> And this is Paradox is a small publisher. Yes, I right? think EA gets like five hundred to a thousand per month. Oh wow! When it comes to their different, you know, EA originals programs and stuff like that. Where, where did these uh, Where did these come from? They come from every which way. To be honest, we have uh, on our website. There's uh, paradoxinteractive.com. Uh, there is just a form you can fill out, and there's direct contact information to us. Mm. You know, just submit your pitch through there. Many of the pitches come through there, but the Best ones come through existing business contacts. I get approached through Twitter all the time. Um, it's a very good way of communicating with people you don't know. Uh, we have also a lot of internal pitches that come across my desk or colleagues or people at Paradox who say, hey, I talked to somebody at this conference. Can they pitch you a game? Sure. And when you say business contacts, that could be anything from a studio we worked with in the past. It could also be just someone you bumped into at you know, some conference. Yeah, or... exactly. Or it might, it might be like we... We're at a conference, we're talking to Larian on some other great RPG studio, and yeah. we say, we really would like to work with you. And they say, no thanks, we're, oh, we're doing quite real? well. Is this, did this, this happen? This is too true. No, oh. it, we've always had a good uh, conversation going with them. And they've been, you know, that's the problem with a, uh, for us as a, as a business developer and publisher is that... Larian, for those who don't know, are the developers of the amazing uh, Divinity Original Sin series. Exactly. The yeah. second one was uh, released just recently to rave reviews. Yeah. Uh, no, but if somebody's incredibly successful... They are obviously creating success by their own, and they are uh, they don't quite need a publishing partner. It, th- those kind of cases are hard. But in some cases, like with Obsidian, obviously massively successful on their own right, but they maybe realize that, hey, we're not interested in building that publishing capacity ourselves. Mm-hmm. Let's find a good partner for that. Obsidian, obviously developers of many, many amazing games, but perhaps most uh, close closest to us are the fantastic Pillars of Eternity and uh, Tyranny. Tyranny games that we both published. Yeah. A thousand pitches a year. Is the, I mean, that sounds like a lot. Is that is this a good thing? Are there no, it's, or I mean, can well, you give all of these people the attention they you know rightly deserve? Everyone gets a response uh, unless our IT systems go down. But but out of those thousand, most are not relevant for our business. We yeah. have uh, very uh, you know narrow requirements for what makes a, a paradox game a paradox game. So most of the time, if it's a, like a pogo peggle kind of mm. game, we say no thanks quite immediately and say good luck. Even uh, if it's with vampires? Even if it, especially if it's with vampires, right? right? Uh, but ultimately, there are very few type of games that we want to do, or a game might even be right, but it might be too small because we're a much bigger company nowadays, mm-hmm. or it might be that we're already doing that kind of game, or we don't think that the developer can um, do what is required, or we think that we won't be able to agree on the business terms. There are hundreds of different factors that make a concept that is good, impossible to do, let alone those that are not good, right? Mm. But most concepts are not good because most people are like yourself. You have a great idea, but no way to actually make the game. What and do we you ex- know about my game development skills? I, I'm just <laughs> assuming. I might be the key to our next, you know. I doubt it. Um, <laughs> so what we see is that, uh, we, t- we actually state that on the website is that we love your great idea, but please don't send us your idea. We have our own ideas 
Uh, if you have the team and capacity to make a demo or something, please send that to us. Sure. Your ideas. The, it's not just about the ideas is what no. you're saying. This is essentially how we pick up new... Um, New games then, but do we do, I mean, a lot of people come to us, but how about outreach? I mean, how do we, can you talk a bit about that? Sure. How do we work with approaching people? We have a number of games that we think that would be amazing to make, right? Uh, and City Skylines kind of started in that sense that we'd been making Cities in Motion with Colossal Order, uh, the Finnish developer that makes those games. And we were talking about, like, we'd love to make a City Builder game, but we didn't feel that the time was ready. Uh, and then finally that time came and we kind of started doing it. And right now we're approaching a bunch of different developers and saying, we think that this idea, from a market standpoint, from a business standpoint, makes sense. What, what do you think about this? Would you like to put together a pitch based on your creative vision of how that could work? And then that becomes a, a good end. So it's a kind of a pull-push kind of configuration. Sure. Okay. So uh, it all boils down. To, at, at some point, someone's going to pitch you something. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about that then. What do we look for? What is a good pitch? What makes a pitch interesting to us? And what would you say makes a pitch into a useful one that's going to get you, make you successful in pitching your game. Right. Um, I mean, even though we see a lot of uh, pitches, I wouldn't say that we're any pitch experts, but I can identify a number of like best practices that result in uh, you being able to convey your idea effectively. And these tips are actually ubiquitous and don't relate to game pitches. I think that the, the main thing I tell people is that if I can't understand what your game or idea is about, within just a few sentences, you failed. You have to make it unequivocally clear why this is a fun a game and how it's played uh, really quickly, immediately. This can be done through a really cool sentence. It's Dark Souls, but with Zelda's, uh, let's say, you know, but you take one game and add something else. To you. It's the leveling from this game plus the core loop combat from Dark Souls. Ah, I get how this game is played. Sure. Right, uh, or you talk about a player fantasy that you run and rule as a medieval ruler, and you have to maintain your hold over your household, uh, and it has prison architect kind of mechanics. Yeah, in how you build stuff. Okay, I get the game. I can combine CK with that. So, or you just put together a video of your actual demo running, or concept art, or whatever it is. So, convey an idea in a succinct and uh, efficient way. We talk about an elevator pitch, and that's being able to describe your idea in. 20 or 30 seconds or less. Or yeah, so. but it's it's all like one sentence and then you can sort of extrapolate from that. Right? Because all, yeah, exactly. All pitches are exactly like... Well, sorry, can we give a couple of examples here? I mean, I know the, the pitch for, the one sentence pitch for City Skylines is something like a modern take on the classic city builder, right? Yeah, that ended up That's being very like clear. More, That's very yeah. clear. What, what do we have, any, do you know any other examples by heart of games we've put out? I'm putting you on the spot here. <laughs> I think that for some of our Crusader games, uh, the kind of tagline or, or you know, elevator pitch is like the me the ultimate medieval fantasy trip. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, I think for Gears of War, one of the taglines they work with and that what permeated every aspect of design was Marcus Phoenix is a badass. That's interesting. And that kind of captured the entire uh, ethos of the game. Sure. So whenever they were designing, how does Marcus Phoenix, uh, who's a big guy, how does he open chests and boxes well he kicks them open of course he does how does he because open he's a badass he's, he's a badass how does he open doors he kicks them open because he's a badass <laughs> and how does he reload like a badass right everything just centered around this uh, yeah. concept right and yeah your main point here is that you, you know you should be able to in just a couple of words convey the the core uh, of of what what the game is that you're trying to make exactly. So this is quite similar to to my experience working in journalism. Before I joined Paradox, which was only about eight months ago, I spent years working as a, a news editor and and sort of a managing editor for various news websites and even printed magazines when that was a when that was still a thing. Um, and I'd listen to pitches from freelancers all literally all day, and it was very much the same. I mean, this could be over the phone, this could be an uh, an email or whatever, but that didn't really matter as long as it was very clear to me what the story was. And that's essentially a headline. Mm. So, you know, you need, what's the essence of what you're trying to sell? What, what sort of makes it fun or relevant or interesting? And how can you summarize that in a, as few words as possible? Yeah. And if you can't do that, then you're sort of starting from the wrong end, right? Yeah. Yeah. When we have an idea that we like, what's, what's sort of the next step then? So the next step is, you know, uh, any pitch or idea is just like a, the cover letter for a job application. And I think most people understand that the cover letter is only it serves one purpose. Mm. And the purpose is to get your foot through the door. 
Because if the pitch is good, somebody's going to sit down and then want to have an extensive conversation with you. And in that conversation, you can actually then tell them what the game is about. You have more than one sentence to describe that, right? Um, so the, the process after that is, A, understanding what their vision is for the game. Once we understand it, we can then figure it out if it matches our needs. And then we can start asking one of the most important questions. Can it make money? And then we ask the third question, which is, does the developer have what it takes in order to succeed with the game? And then the fourth question, for us at least, is does Paradox as a publisher have what it takes to succeed with this game? Mm-hmm. A lot of people approach us with um, you know, action games. And I can see that the business case is cool. It should make a lot of money. They can sure, sure as hell make it. But we have no idea how to publish a sports action game. Yeah, I mean, because I think that, I mean, at least we like to think that this is something that distinguishes us uh, a bit. At least internally, we've got like a very, very clear idea of what it is that, what, what yeah. is a paradox game, essentially. I, I think maybe this is something we can go deeper into in a future podcast, yeah. but it's, uh, you know, that's equally important to us or even more important to us, right? That a game is sort of a good fit for what we are and what we want to be, that it's a good game in, in, in its own right. Absolutely. I think that ultimately there's a lot of money that can be made in games, but not all of that is for us to make. I want our portfolio to stand for something. When people hear it's a paradox game, already know that there, it comes with implicit promise of tons of replayability, it'll challenge my senses, and I get to create something. Yeah, I feel smart when I play the game, and the game rewards me for being smart. Yeah, The goal is to people to hear, like, Paradox is releasing a game, I'm buying it, I don't care what it is, because I know it's Paradox. Yeah, there's a lot of values that should be sort of, that should come with that. Transcend uh, the games them- themselves. Yeah, exactly. So replayability, uh, you know, modding, all of that stuff. So going back to what we talked about in the beginning, a game like Teleglitch, for example, yeah. which came out, what, three years ago? Yeah. Would we have published a game like Teleglitch? Absolutely we, not. We wouldn't publish that today, right? Uh, absolutely not. And why, why is that? Over the years, Paradox has tried different types of games, and we've always been interested in growing and avoiding stagnation. We want to avoid our kind of Kodak moment. And for mm. those of you that are not familiar with that, the Kodak, which was the, uh, the film company who made uh, actual films for cameras and a lot of cameras, they were doing amazingly in the 70s. Uh, they had their best year the year before they went bankrupt because wow. they didn't adjust quickly enough to the changing market around them. They were like, we're making tons of money off of these cameras. Why should we adjust to these kind of digital formats that are appearing? And they actually had developed a digital camera, but decided we don't want to sell this because it's going to hurt our core business. So we've always been interested in trying different types of games because that allowed us to, you know, spread risk and, uh, you know, stay topical. And that's why over the years, besides just doing strategy games, we've tried doing different types of games. And most of the time they haven't worked, but once in a while, these other games have really taken off. Mountain Blade was a series that worked really well, huge action component. And then Magicka was another game also that, you know, didn't quite match, but it did incredibly well. So after Magicka, there was this opening in the market where indie games for a lower price could do quite well. Uh, And we try to capitalize on that uh, by doing a number of games. And I think that we could have succeeded more if we'd maintain a stronger focus on the success criteria for those kind of games. I think we selected a number of games that had limited upsides. Uh, Showdown Effect was only mul- multiplayer only. Teleglitch uh, looks very particular and doesn't. It, it's a limiting factor in that sense. Sure, and that window is now closing, is your point then? Right, so today we are only active in, we do management games, strategy games, and RPGs. And we don't try other things unless there's really, really good cause for it or it aligns with our strategy and to move to other genres. Mm. All right, let's try to uh, wrap this up with a couple of lists because, you know, who doesn't love lists, right? Yeah. So, uh, Shams, top three games that weren't published by Paradox that, but that you wish uh, would have been. Oh, wow. One of my all-time favorite games, Kerbal Space Program. Mm. Um, I'd say the Football Manager games and Clay's don't starve. Oh yeah. All, so all three of those would be a good fits for They would paradox. be perfect fits for paradox in the sense that they're infinitely replayable. They're very hardcore. They allow you to create something. If it's a story, a ship, or a, a base or whatever it is, you, you're putting your creative mark on it. Uh, the games are uh, somewhat easy to get into, and once you're stuck, you're there forever. Did we talk to any of these developers? Yes. Before Kerbal Space Program was bought by 2K, I was relentlessly pursuing them. Mm. Uh, football managers owned by Sega and they're doing quite well thank you very much and Don't Starve is again uh, owned by and run by the amazing developers over at Clay who everything they 
touch turns into uh, gold. So yes, we did talk to we t- Clay we t- and yeah, but not specifically for Don't Start. We talked about other projects, but you know, no, we I met uh, their CEO a couple of weeks ago. He's a great guy, great studio, amazing talent and team, and we learn a lot from each other. All right, uh, how about this one then? Top three games that were offered to Paradox, but we declined. Okay, I'll answer this with a disclaimer first. I'll answer this with a song, I thought you would say. <laughs> that would have been great. Um, because a game is offered to us doesn't mean that we would have gotten it in the end. Sure, of course. That. But with that said, World of Tanks, Rocket League, and Psychonauts 2. Oh, wow. You should see that. Oh, man, I wish we had a camera here because you should see the face <laughs> Charles is making right no, now. No, like every time... Like, Hang on. <laughs> you said no to World of Tanks? Yes. I think uh, it was actually Fred who said no thanks. Wow. Uh, we actually worked with those guys to publish a game or do, I think, European distribution many years ago. Okay. And it did not do well. Uh, so when they started making their second game, World of Tanks, they gave us rights. Not worldwide, I think, but it was some kind of rights right. to help publish it. And we said no because A was online and a lot of action stuff. Yeah. Rocket League as well. Rocket League, yeah. I mean, they were looking for a lot of different partners towards the end as they were nearing completion. I played the game and I was like, this is amazing. It's going to sell like hotcakes. No thanks. Wow. Because it's an action-driven game. It has a lot of sports components. It's got cars uh, or, uh, you know, thematically it made zero sense. Sure. It was very far from yeah. What, yeah. We're and doing, I, what we were doing then, but also what we're doing today. Exactly. And I told them that this, um, you could probably find a better partner for this than us. Wow. Yeah. Do you think that was, I mean, it's always easy, <laughs> hindsight is, uh, but was that the right decision? I don't know. I mean, it's, I think it's the right decision for the purpose of, if, if our strategy is to maintain Paradox identity and that's how we're going to keep growing by mm. standing for something, I think in that respect, it was right. But also, you know, if we'd said yes to it and it would have, we'd be the ones publishing and it suddenly did amazingly well we would then send we have this small part of the portfolio that are the grand strategy games and sure. some some weirdo management games but our real business is publishing uh sports arena uh, action games yeah and then P- paradox would have changed and this is maybe if you look at nintendo very interesting company they pivoted really when the wii took off like crazy and most hardcore gamers felt that this was clashing with their understanding of like i play my hardcore games on a nintendo platform and suddenly they were playing you know we bowling and that was the main thrust of it yeah it was a very clear break with the sort of traditional hardcore yeah. Nintendo. so if base. we'd said yes to rocket league or world of tanks uh, and they'd become the successes they are today and i don't think they would have been successful as successful because, because you bowling. would have been responsible yeah, exactly <laughs> exactly we know what happens then exactly so um that would have changed the face of the company sure um for the better for the worse it depends uh it would have been a different All right uh, Interesting. Paradox, I think. All right, so let's try to summarize then. Let's go back to... Wait, to... Do, do you not have any favorite games? That, what, what about your lists? You mean that I think we should have published? Yes. Mm, I mean, I've, <laughs> I think Rocket League is really good. I would have, it I is good, but it's, is, it a, it, is it a paradox game? No, I, I agree. I see what you mean. It's about sort of short term versus long term, right? Yeah. But it's, that's so difficult. It's, you can't make... Are like there in any hindsight, games? It's, it's impossible to make any sort of judgments on this because yeah. at the time, who knew? Like, who knew that game would take off? Yeah. And that's kind of what, what big hits are about as well, right? So yeah. I think the best way of ensuring long-term survival, of course, it's having a plan and sticking to that plan. I mean, that's... Is, is there a game out there that you kind of look at and say, oh man, this feels like a Paradox game? Or was there a game before you joined Paradox that you were like, oh, why aren't they not publishing this? This feels like a perfect fit. That's a difficult question. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think Rocket League, I see your point, but to me, that ticks all the boxes, really. Okay. Except the fact that it's cars and, you know, football, and right? Driven, but, it has, it, it has a, it's hardcore in the sense that it has a Twitch-based skill component. It's yeah. not cerebral. You, you're not rewarded for being a smart player. Like, Heart's Fire, the yeah. smarter you are, the more you get out of the game and the game rewards you for being smart. Yeah, all right. I'm not going to argue with you on this because this is this is what you get paid for. Yeah. So, you know, I take your I take your word for it. So, um, for those of you who are hopefully listening to this, I hope you enjoyed this first episode of our little podcast. Uh, we enjoyed recording it, right? Did we? Shams, Great fun. Did you enjoy this? Great fun. Cool. And also, uh, as said, let us know what you think. Tell us what you'd like us to talk about in the next episode. Tell us what we should stop doing. Tell us what we should do more of. Uh, we're both on Twitter. I think we'll be able to link the signatures in the podcast description. Or but I think if like you that. just search for our names, Daniel Goldberg and Shamster John, yeah, you'll, you'll pop you'll find up us somewhere uh, on some platform. Um, yeah, and thanks a lot for listening. See you. See you all in two weeks. Ciao. Bye. Bye.